Okay, we finished last time by noting that Quine is going to argue that uh, no statement is analytic and that in fact all statements are synthetic. So no statement according to Quine is true in virtue of its meaning alone and all statements are true, made true uh, if they're true, at least partly by the way the world is. Uh, in this video, we'll look at uh, a couple of arguments for that claim. So here's the first argument. We'll call it the circularity argument. And it goes like this. Suppose Quine says to you, well, what is it for a statement to be analytic? You might say something like this. Well, it's true in virtue of its meaning alone. And then he says, well, what does it mean for a statement to be true in virtue of its meaning alone? You might say, well, it's uh, appealing to synonyms. So the statement sisters are female siblings is true in virtue of its meaning alone because this, the word sister is synonymous with the conjunction of cis, female and sibling. Now, I say, well, what is it for two words to be synonymous? What is it for sister to be synonymous with female sibling? And you might say, well, it's for them to have the same meaning. Sister and female sibling are synonymous if they have the same meaning. And then Quine's going to say, well, what is it for two terms to have the same meaning? And you might say, well, look, sister and female sibling have the same meaning if the sentence, sisters are female siblings, is true by definition. And then Quine will say, well, what is it for a statement to be true by definition? And you might say, well, it's true in virtue of the concepts expressed by the words. So the statement, sisters are female siblings, is true by definition because it expresses the concept sister and the concept female sibling, and maybe the concept sister contains the concepts of female and sibling. Kant used this language to exp uh, explain uh, a priori uh, analyticity. He talked about containment, one word containing another or one concept containing another. And then someone might say, well, what is it for one concept to contain another or for a proposition to be true in virtue of the concepts involved? And you might say, well, it's for it to be a priori in a certain sort of way. Um, don't worry about the word narrowly right now. We'll just say it's for it to be a priori, made true by the con relations among the concepts. And then I say, well, what is it for a statement to be a priori? And we get back to, oh, a statement is a priori if it's analytic. Remember, we kind of started out the semester that way. We said, like, let's, there's some knowledge that can't be had through experience, so it must be a priori. And then we ask, how can anything be a priori? How can anything be knowable without experience? And the answer is, well, when a statement is analytic, you can know its truth value without experience. And so it looks like we've started by asking what analyticity is, and we've gone through some circle that was, according to Quine, uninformative. We just went around and around and around. None of these terms, none of these expressions, can be cashed out, can be made sense of in a way that is satisfactory to Quine, in a way that he thinks makes any sense. So that's the circularity argument. Um, now, I'll just say one thing about this argument. Uh, the simplest kind of reply to this argument is to say that, well, there's various points along the circle at which I start to understand what's going on. So maybe when you first ask me, what is it for a statement to be analytic? And I say, well, it's for it to be true in virtue of its meaning alone. You might say, well, but I don't understand that, really. And then I say, well, look, um, consider some examples. Being a sis in the statement, uh, sisters are siblings, uh, or sisters are female siblings, is true in virtue of its meaning alone because the word sister is synonymous with the, the expression uh, female sibling. Well, at that point, you may be like, oh, I kind of get it now. And if, even if you don't, and I say, look, you say, what is it for two words to be synonymous? And I say, well, they have to have the same meaning. And you might think, oh, I get that. Or the point is that there's various points in this circle where you might be happy to say, okay, I now understand it. Even if initially starting at one point you don't get it, going around the circle seems informative. It seems like you kind of do hone in on something. Um, now, you don't have to accept that reply. I'm just pointing out that's the kind of standard reply to this version of Quine's argument. Um, Quine's second argument it's a bit more sophisticated. It's called the revisability argument, or I should say I call it the revisability argument. And it goes like this. Any claim, any claim at all, we can make let claim stand for statement here. So any statement can be rejected by someone who understands it. Well, if a claim is analytic, a statement is analytic, then it can't be rejected by someone who understands it. Therefore, no claim is analytic. Now, Quine thinks, uh, he, needs, he, has a, he has a burden to support these premises. So what's the motivation for the first claim, that any claim can be rejected by someone who understands it? Quine offers kind of an a odd example. I mean, maybe it's not odd, but 
I think it's, it's not the most obvious example. Um, after we go through Quine's argument, I'll offer you what I take to be a, a more obvious example. Um, but let's start with Quine's example here. He says, well, look, if any claim is analytic, then either one or two here is. Now, what is this thing here, the U arrow A? I'm letting this stand for something we can call an understanding ascent link. That's a, this is a phrase from Timothy Williamson, who talks about understanding ascent links. So what is an understanding ascent link? Well, the idea is, uh, take a claim like sisters are female siblings. The idea is, if you understand that claim, then you're going to assent to it. You're going to say yes to it, sisters are female siblings. Or take a claim like uh, nothing is entirely red and green at the same time in the same place, you know, in, in, across its entire surface. Well, if you understand colors, not empirical claims about colors, just what color terms are, uh, you'll assent to that claim. That's the idea. I'm not saying that's right. I'm just saying that's the idea. Um, <clears throat> so under, as, analyticities, wh when a claim is analytic, the idea goes there will be some sort of understanding assent link. So if an understanding assent link holds for any claim, then it holds for claim, these two claims. So one of them is there is no causation at a distance, and the other is nothing can be in two places at once. Now it's important to be clear about what these two different claims mean. The claim that there is no causation at a distance means there is no efficient causation. We're not talking about like Aristotelian formal causation. We're talking or about ordinary, like you know, smoking causes cancer, or uh, I don't know, um, you know, exercise causes lower blood blood pressure or something like this. We're talking about ordinary causation. Um, <clears throat> and the claim nothing can be in two places at once, we're not talking about parts of things. Like obviously your head can be in one spot and your feet can be in another spot, and in that sense your body can be in two places at once. We're talking about entire objects. So the claim is no entire object can be entirely present in two distinct places. So the idea is I can't have my entire body in the classroom and my entire body at home on my couch at the same time, okay? Um, so let's take these two claims, says Quine, and see what to make of them. He says, look, um, suppose it's true that anyone who understands causation should assent to one, should say, yes, there's no causation at a distance. And anyone who understands thing, the notion of an object, should assent to two, that no object is wholly present in two places at, a, at the same time. Well, then we're going to have to reject quantum mechanics. Why? Because on dominant interpretations of quantum phenomenon, at least one of these two claims is false. That is, our best theories of quantum mechanics imply that either one is false or two is false. Why is that? Well, suppose these two particles are such that the position of one determines the position of the other, but there's nothing in between them causing that, right? There's no like this bumps this, which bumps this, which bumps this, which bumps this, and then causes this to move. It's rather that when this one takes on a determinate position, this one does too. Well, you're going to have to say one of two things, the idea goes. Either you're going to have to say that this object is wholly present here and wholly present here, and that's why the position of this determines the position of this, or you're going to have to say this object taking on a certain value causes that object to take on a certain value, even though they're distant, even though there's nothing in between them. Um, <clears throat> so the idea goes, uh, if you accept this result from quantum mechanics, you have to be, at the same time, either rejecting the claim that there's no causation at a distance or rejecting that no object is wholly present in two distinct places at one time. But, says Quine, if anything is analytic, then one and two are analytic. So how could you possibly reject one of them? You must be revealing your lack of understanding of what they say. But, says Quine, people who take quantum mechanics to undermine one or two aren't demonstrating that they fail to understand what one and two are saying. Instead, they do understand what one or two are, are saying, and they think that they've been shown empirically, at least it's been shown empirically that at least one of them is false. Um, incidentally, so, so uh, here's Quine, we should accept our best theories in quantum mechanics, or at least someone can rationally accept those theories. Surely people who accept those theories don't fail to understand one and two. It follows that any claim can be rejected by one who understands it. Um, there's a simpler claim, incidentally, uh, about the, there's a simpler way to see the no causation at a distance thing. If you uh, have learned from basic physics anything about gravity, 
you know that the gravitational force operating between two objects is a function of their mass and their distance, roughly. So the sun is really massive, but also really far away. So the gravitational force it exerts on me um, is whatever it is. A much uh, the same object mass object being closer would have more gravitational force. Um, a object that's uh, smaller and closer might have the same gravitational force because again, gravitational force is a function of uh, mass and distance. Well, if gravitational force is a function of mass and distance, then I can change the gravitational force that the sun is exerting on me and that I am exerting on the sun by raising my hand because when I raise my hand, it gets a bit closer to the sun. But how could I change the tug on the sun by raising my hand? That looks like causation at a distance. It looks like I'm causing the force operating on the sun to change the second that I raise my hand with no intervening causation, right? It takes light a while to get from one place to the other. At any rate, um, Quine thinks that uh, he's demonstrated that any claim can be rejected by someone who understands it. We'll look at another reason why you might think that later. <clears throat> and Quine points out it's experience that leads us to reject one and two, so not only can any claim be rejected by someone who understands it, any claim can be rejected on the basis of experience by someone who understands it. Okay, so that's the first premise of the revisability argument. What about the second premise? It says, if a claim is analytic, then if one understands it, one can't reject it. So if a claim is analytic, then if you understand it, you can't reject it. This you can think of as providing a sort of tie between the metaphysical notion of analyticity and the epistemic notion. So the, remember, the metaphysical notion says a claim is analytic if it's true in virtue of its meaning alone. The epistemic notion of analyticity says a claim is analytic if you can see that it's true just by checking its meaning. So the metaphysical version tells you something about what makes the statement true. Its meaning makes it true. The epistemic version doesn't tell you something about what makes the statement true. It tells you something about how you can know the truth value of the statement. You can know the truth value of the statement by reflecting the meaning, by grasping the meaning. So why would someone think that if a claim is metaphysically analytic, then it's epistemically analytic? Put another way, why would someone think that if a claim is analytic, then if one understands it, one can't reject it? Well, here's a little argument. If a claim is analytic, then if one understands it, then one sees that it's analytic. Now, I should say the little argument I'm giving here goes beyond anything Quine says. I'm kind of trying to fill in gaps for him based on what he does say. Anyway. If a claim is analytic, then if you understand it, then you can see that it's analytic. If you can see that a claim is analytic, then you see that it's true. Therefore, if a claim is analytic, then if you understand it, you can see that it's true. Well, if you see that a claim is true, then you can't reject it. So it follows that if a claim is analytic, then if you understand it, then you can't reject it. So you know we have our claim too. Now, I think this claim here, this uh, subsidiary premise 2.4, is quite plausible. If you see that a claim is true, then you can't reject it. Now, to be clear, when I say you can't reject it, it's rationally reject it. So the idea here is uh, basically that the law of non-contradiction holds. You can't see that a claim is true, say, yes, it's true, and at the same time say, but I don't think it's true. So that's plausible. All it requires is the law of non-contradiction. I think this claim here is also plausible. It says, if you see that a claim is analytic, then you see that it's true. Well, remember, we're on the left-hand side here, we're talking about the metaphysical notion of analyticity, which says a claim is true in virtue of its meaning. So the idea goes, if you see that a claim is true in virtue of its meaning, then you see that it's true. Well, that seems trivial. If you see that it's true in a certain way, then you see that it's true. So I think 2.2 .2 is also plausible. However, this claim here, if a claim is analytic, then if you understand it, you see that it's analytic, seems less obvious. So let's consider an example. This is a picture of my son. It's not a recent picture. He's older than this now. But um, in this picture, he's, say, like, I don't remember how old, but let's say six years old. Um, I think at six years old, he understood that his sister uh, sisters are female. Okay? So he knows sisters are female. If you say to him, are sisters female, he'll say yes. He probably understood that sisters are female siblings. So let's just say he does. So you say to him, are sisters female siblings? He'll say yes. Um, so let's suppose further that the claim sisters are female siblings is analytic. So we now have, since my son understands, si sorry, since the claim sisters are female siblings is analytic and my son understands it, 
he must see that it's analytic. But in order to see that it's analytic, he would have to have the concept of analyticity. And I just don't think that's true. More generally, I don't think it's true, you know, because I don't think it's true that six-year-olds have the concept of analyticity, have the concept of truth and virtue of meaning. More generally, I don't think it's true that just because some claim is analytic and you understand what it says, just because little kids can understand what a sister is and sisters or siblings is analytic, I don't think it's true that they must understand analyticity. That seems to require far too much. It seems to require far too much to say that if you can understand that bachelors are unmarried, you must understand what it is for a sentence to be analytic. So this 2.1 here seems implausible. And once you reject 2.1, you no longer have any reason to accept 2.3, and so no longer have any reason to accept 2. <clears throat> and then once you have no longer have any reason to accept 2, you no longer have any reason to accept the conclusion that no claim is analytic. So I think Quine's revisability argument uh, is implausible. Now there's another kind of rejection that's more standard of Quine's uh, argument here. And the other rejection goes like this. It says, one is false, that any claim can be rejected by someone who understands it. That's just not true. Um, you can only reject the claim if you sort of change its meaning. So take the claim sisters are female siblings. The idea goes, nobody who understands that claim can reject it. And anybody who comes up with a case where they say, here's a case where I imagine that it's false that sisters are female siblings, has changed the meaning of sisters are female siblings. Um, so you're not really rejecting the analyticity. You're just considering that some other use of those words could lead to a falsehood. Um, I, I don't, actually don't think that's right. I think those cases are trickier than that argument suggests. Um, but someone like David Chalmers has put forward that as a reason to reject number one. OK, um, we'll stop this video there and continue next time by looking at an alternative reason to accept one, the claim that any claim can be rejected by someone who understands it, one that Quine doesn't consider but I think is more interesting, or at least is interesting.